TCP Nation, oh, I just want to sit back in this chair and talk to a guy I respect, I look up to, I'm, I'm proud to say my kids are about his, at least Jess Lee's age. I mean, they're getting to compete in some sports together. Juve Sierra, Juvenal, what year did you graduate? 1991. 91. Let's see, I'm a 96, so I'm about five, five years, years behind you, but I do remember you. Just because you're kind of this tall, right. imposing guy, especially for me. I must have been like about eighth grade, maybe a freshman or senior. Probably, probably eighth an eighth grade. grader. Eighth grader, yeah. Did you wear these big old huge gloves? Yes, in you remember football? those gloves? Those, yeah, I remember those. Those were awesome. Those were like bear paws, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wish they still had them. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Anyways, we're going to talk about life, uh, work, business, philosophy around uh, just kind of being the best you can be. I think that's something you try to do. And I don't know that. I've never even asked you that question. This is just from me watching you, just living in this community with you and seeing what you've done. Plus, I did this episode with Mr. Wilson, Mr. James right. Wilson, right. our elementary principal, and he told me a little story about your family. So I got me even more interested. I'm like, I don't even know Juve's family. Right. At all. <laughs> so let, I want to talk about them a little bit. So, you know, I guess the first order of business is always this simple thing that you know so well, but a lot of people that listen may not. They go, where'd you come from? Like, like <laughs> where did you come from? I mean, we're in Comanche, Texas. We kind of got connected in that way, but right. is that where you've always been from? Tell that story a little bit. Yes, born in, uh, I don't want to say this too loud, born in Deleon. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. But I am from Comanche County, uh, uh, so I'm the youngest of five siblings. Um the way we ended up in Comanche, my dad back in the 50s was in this, what you call the Bracero program. And he traveled, he pretty much traveled, I think, to 36 states, what he counted at one time, just back and forth, back and forth. And they load him up on a plane and, and go harvest. And, and then finally one day he decided to, or he, he went, he worked in the ports of Mexico. He was always an entrepreneur and tried to do better for his family. And, and, and one day he decided to, he found Hico, Texas out of, uh, and they were harvesting here and he decided to stay in Hico, Texas. And there was an opportunity back then to, um, to get his family back to, to, to United States. And, and he, uh, I was, I, he brought my mom and, and, and two siblings and left two down there in Mexico. And back then you didn't have no communication, no internet, no phones were very limited. And so, you know, for about a year, the, 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 uh, my oldest sisters did not know anything about my parents. They didn't know if they were still alive. They didn't know where they were at. Left them with an aunt. And I think the aunt abandoned them after about a month. And they were living in the city by themselves. And these were 13, 14 year old girls. But they had oh, good wow. neighbors yeah. around them that took care of them. And, and they all took care of each other. And it was kind of the city. What city? San Luis, uh, Potosi is the name of the city. It's about. 16 hours from here deep, <laughs> yeah. deep mexico now when you say city i mean i'm picturing big is it like a suburb of mexico city or and then it was uh it city's about about thirty thousand out in the suburbs of a, of a bigger city and everybody knew everybody and 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 they finally got everybody down here i was born here and 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 my parents got their papers and they ended up in the harold easley dairy which last time you know bell bean was the uh he started the dairy that was his father-in-law and and we worked for the Easleys for about 20 years, and and I remember my dad going. We'd go to Mexico once a year for about a month, and that's that. It was a pickup with a with a camper shell, and he was like Santa Claus for everybody down there. It take us two two days to get down there, but he makes sure he took care of all of his siblings and and friends, and 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 we would every night we would spend with somebody's family with a big dinner because he was always bringing them something. And grandma would get mad because he would never spend time with grandma because he was always we were always getting invited to all these parties down there, and he was like the uh, the Santa Claus to all those families down there because he wanted to give back to his community, and 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 I looking at that we were in the back of this truck like sardines my brother and I and we just didn't have any room. It took us two days to get there, and it was a miserable, miserable ride because we were packed in there. Well, <laughs> and in a camper shell in, in the back of a truck. In the back of a like truck. Uh, if you never rode like that, there's no AC. There's no AC. <laughs> You're yeah. hoping for some wind, maybe a little cracked window, but it's not air conditioned back there. <laughs> and, and he was one of the very first pioneers in that area that, that, that decided to come to the States. And, 
and and after that, several people follow several of his of his of his siblings and and cousins and 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 we still go back. He still goes back every now and then, not as much, but he still has some friends and everybody remembers him. And 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 it was neat to see that everybody appreciated what he did down there. With, you know, brought either with new clothes and mom would shop throughout the year, try to get them clothes and 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 just took care to try to take care of some of those family members down there. What he would do. What, what, what? Did you ever ask him or why, why did he, was that just a, a cultural thing or why did he want to go back and do that? I mean, you'll hear it said, man, I want to get to America cause that's where all the opportunity is. And then a lot of times it seems like I'm just getting out of wherever I am cause I'm looking for better. He kind of wanted to go back. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think he saw that he was, like I said, one of the first in that area, and he and he felt that these folks needed something positive during Christmas, and we'd go during Christmas, and he and he, and to see a kid have a new toy or, or just a new Wrangler jean, which was the best, to see the face of and see the face of the parents, it was just, it, it was incredible. I didn't even think about it back then, back then, but the amount of families that he would that he affected was just. And it was and it was good friends and 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 they were they appreciate like I said we have big parties we'd have food a lot of food they'd always invite us we were always going to somebody's house that I didn't know and my parents grew up with and, and they would always invite y'all need to come eat with us tonight and yeah. and grandma was mad all the time like are you ever gonna spend time with me I said well they're inviting us to, we always had friends and relatives they would always invite us to eat over because my dad always wouldn't forget those people that was around him the whole time yeah what was his name Juan Juan just like my brother. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, tell me about your brother a little bit. Okay. So we're 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 still kind of talking about where you're from, but we mm-hmm. we might take a right. We might take a a jaunt down a little different road. Right? Yeah. I mean, so Mr. Wilson's story is your dad coming up to school, keeping an eye on Juan because a note had got home that Juan was acting up in class a little bit, and Mr. Wilson's. I almost want to just call him cute because I mean he's just. Like, Juan's a great guy, but he's a little bit of a troublemaker, you right. know. I mean, he's, he didn't have any problem with him, but he needed a little bit of help figuring out I need to do what I'm told. So tell me about Juan a little bit. Uh, what is Juan your next oldest brother? Juan is is five years older than myself, and <laughs> one thing about Juan, Juan taught me how not to get spankings because Juan got he got it rough sometimes. Yeah. I mean, he would do things that he was a handful for for my mom and dad. You know, my mom was telling me a story one time that they were at a bus station somewhere on the border and they were about to load, and said, "Where's Juan?" And no, he's nowhere to be seen. So there, he's got his, they got about 10 people looking for him or so or something like that. And he's like three blocks down the road playing with some kids, just disappeared out of the blue. So he, he was a, a, a kid that they always had to discipline, you know. Yeah. And, and today, you know, the water hose, I see, I, I can see it. He gets smacked with that water hose. If you do that today, you know, oh, yeah, you, right. you know you're going to jail or something, you know. <laughs> but, but he got a lot of discipline, and Juan just wouldn't listen. He was just a very mischievous, didn't do nothing really bad. He was always trying to get his, into something, and he always would get into something. And, and my parents always worried about him because he can never never keep him still. Yeah. And, and, and back then, they didn't test for ADHD or not. He might have had some of that. But, right. but he, he was just a very active, and he always was in trouble. And I knew better. So Juan always got in trouble, and I kind of just say I'm not going to go to that point because Juan would get some good, good spankings, good. <laughs> he he belt, got some good, good discipline. belts. He knew a lot of leather. Juan knew yeah. about leather, you know. So, oh my gosh, I mean that's just a whole other topic. Like, I think that's good. Like, Juan wasn't being abused. No, he was being taught risk, reward, consequence, all these kind of concepts in in a very understandable way right. at least in my estimation my experience hey i've known leather <laughs> you know right i mean right. it ain't like i escaped the leather but in today's world like you said man you might go to jail right well i don't know i think you might almost go to jail for not teaching your kids something right can we turn that on the opposite direction <laughs> you know there was a lot of love in the family but there's a lot a lot of discipline and, yeah. and, and and there was never any abuse in the family mm-hmm. yeah and and you kind of grew up in the same same time period it was you respected mom and dad you didn't you didn't ever talk back to them and if you did you better get ready 
And so th- those times sadly have changed somewhat. And kind of what Mr. Wilson said the other day, it was the, 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 the parents that were helping the school. Yeah. It was the parents saying, yeah, if he's going to get a spanking at home, you're going to get it one worse. I mean, he's going to get one in school. It's going to be worse at home. Yeah. And so it was, there's different times, but it was, there was a lot of love in the family, but there was a lot of discipline. Well, too. that is love. Yeah. 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 Isn't it? Yes, sir. Like, think about it. Mm-hmm. If you're parenting, coaching, trying to build a team, like if you don't care, if you don't love them, the number one sign of that is you don't try to teach them anything you don't hold them accountable that's a very clear sign to me if i'm on the team nobody's trying to hold me accountable i'm pretty sure they don't care about me if they if they do then they care they're trying they're they're putting in effort to make me a better in some way yeah it hurts it's not always fun to get told you're doing something wrong it, and, and it's all and it's all on, on how your structure is at home, in my opinion, you know, but I'll tell you a quick story about four years ago, five years ago, a young man, uh, his mom was leaving to, to another community and 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 people said he had, he had issues, he had problems, but he was my best baseball player. And I said, you know, I asked mom, can you stay here? Well, he ended up staying with us three months. And mom fairly made, rarely made communication with him. And I would tell him, do you want to go home? No, I'm okay, coach. So I told my wife one day, maybe we need to think of adopting this young man. He was polite. He was, yes, sir. No, sir. And people, a couple of friends would say, he, you're going to have issues with him. Never had an issue. It was, he loved the structure and he loved the discipline. And he knew, you know, that you know, one time he said the F word in my house. And I said, what did you say? He said, nothing, coach, nothing. I said, I know what you said, and that better and ever be repeated in my house. And it, and it just takes a little bit of discipline sometimes. Yeah. And, and and that's, I think, we as consistency. parents. Consistency. Consistency, correct. I don't know. I listen to podcasts all the time, books written about sales, uh, self-help, just how can I be a better podcaster even. And there's, I know I've heard in there, kids, humans need they need to know where the boundaries are. That's so much easier than to not have any, just having no boundary. Right. Like you have to almost dream up your own boundaries. Well, we're really not capable of doing that very well, especially not at a young age. Right. I mean, it could be argued I couldn't do it well right now today, but you get a little better with age. Awesome. Cool. Well, hey, that, that right there speaks to who you are a little bit in just bringing this kid to your house. I mean, it's a little selfish. He's your best baseball player. Yeah, right. but also people would tell you he's going to be a problem. You're like, well, I hadn't seen that yet. So until I see that, until I experience that, he's not a problem. That is so valuable. Yeehaw, people. You got to listen to that. Don't let the world <laughs> tell you how it is. Right. Find out for yourself. Okay, back to the family. Juan, okay, so he's five years older than you. You got any siblings between you and Juan? Yes, well, there's actually seven of us. I had a brother who died at two and a, and a sister died at one years old, but there's five of us now and, and uh, have a, a sibling in the Metroplex. He works for DFW as an accountant there at the, at the airport. I have a sibling as a nurse in, uh, in uh, Brownwood. Uh, 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 and then I have another sister, three sisters, and a sister lives here in Comanche that works at uh, Appleton's in Stephenville. Okay. So there's five of us. When we first came here, I think my oldest was about my oldest sister was about 16, and she didn't want to go to school. And then my 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 next oldest was 15 or 14. She went to high school not knowing any English, and and she went on to Howard Payne, got her accounting degree, and then and then and then my other sister was about 12, and she went on and got her um, her RN, and then Juan went on to get a civil engineering degree at A and M. And so I I kind of was forced to go to college after. We had that success, and you know, in the family, and then so. <laughs> so where'd you go? A and I graduated from A and M in '96. So uh, proud Aggie. Uh, okay, so one's the close. So wait a second, though. I want to ask this: Are you close now with your siblings? Were you close? So you're the youngest, like right. so. Then that starts to be a pretty big space between oldest and youngest. Tell us a little bit about that dynamic, because I know there are people living through that similar situation, maybe. And and those families are getting smaller these days, too. But I'm always interested in how that shapes who you are. Being the youngest, there's there's something to that. I don't know exactly what it is. Were you really close to any of them? Are you still? What? How would you explain that? You know, when you grow up in a house where you have, you got to share your your bedroom with your brother and sisters got to share a bedroom and then 
mom and dad, you, you end up being pretty close. And, and, and I think you attribute that to mom because every day you made sure you had breakfast together. Every sure you got your clothes were ironed at home. She had dinner ready for you that night. Make sure everybody took a bath, make sure you communicated when you have cell phones, you know? Right. And, and so we, we grew up very close and up to this day, we're all very close. Uh, we, we, I'm kind of the, um, the person they look to me is kind of strange that they may disagree, but they look, <laughs> they, they look to me for, for gathering people together for parties or what you're going to do for mom's birthday, what you're going to do for dad's yeah. birthday. I'm kind of the, uh, the middle person for all this stuff. And, and sometimes we, we do, it's like all siblings, you disagree to a point, but not much at all. We, yeah. we all get along really, really good. So we support each other and help each other out. So when there's a graduation or a birthday, we're all there support. And we didn't have any close cousins growing up around us or any close family members so we kind of learned i think that helps us to stay together because yeah. that we, we didn't i mean we really didn't grow up around any cousins around us i mean the family's the family yeah you're saying something i think doesn't get said enough and you're not saying explicitly but you talked about dad quite a bit being santa claus and doing a lot of entrepreneurial type things thinking outside of whatever people around him might have been thinking sounds like mom was a pretty hard worker too like those moms i feel like sometimes don't get near the credit they deserve for ironing clothes i mean for five kids mm-hmm. <laughs> that is a lot of work now i'm sure at some point she says you got to do it and she's kind of passing those tasks on to the kids just talk about mom for a minute you know, we used to have those pants with patches. Yeah. Now it's 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 the thing now. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, we were like kind of embarrassed going going, yeah. going with torn pants going going to school, sure. but now now that's the thing, and that's that's changed. But I believe what what mothers have done in our society. When, I think when mom went to go work, when both mom and dad had to work, we forgot the family. Yeah. Because mom took care of the. Like the, the, make sure we had the warm food that night. Make sure everybody was bathing. And, and now mom comes home tired, and everybody's so busy. This kid is is playing sports here. This kid may have guitar lessons. This kid, and everybody's kind of trying to just make it as quick as they can. And everybody comes home and gets you a frozen sandwich. Get you, I mean, a frozen pizza or a sure, sandwich or yeah. something. And, and the communication was not there. Mom made sure that we all sat down on that table every night and communicated. And I think that was kept the family united then. And now our society is to the point where we're just go, go, yeah, go. And, that's, I mean, and and mom has to work to, <laughs> to help pay the bills. Because yeah. if mom don't work, it gets it gets harder on the family too. Yeah. You know, so I, I think mom was is the very is the most important part of the what family. What was your mom's name? Maria. Maria. Was, yeah. Yeah. Juan and Maria. Well, high five Juan and Maria. I think you did a really good job. At least with Juve. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's some really cool stuff. Okay. Uh, anything left on the family front that we want to talk about? So you lost these siblings young. Mm-hmm. Were they... See, my dad... It's kind of a crazy story. My dad might not have even been born, except for my grandmother had two miscarriages prior to having wow. then four healthy children. So you don't know what God's plan is in a lot of this what so how so one two did they get sick was it accidents what happened well back then they didn't have the best they they lived in a very remote village there wasn't any doctors they have a fever and you you don't have no medication and 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 to see my mom my mom lost her 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 mother when she was about six kind of raised herself or or, and and she kind of would tell her stories been been going to aunt's house or this aunt they kind of raised themselves and and then losing her, her her two kids and i never heard her complain one bit about life yeah and and to see when i a lot, a lot of times when i see people hear people complain i was like hey it can be worse yeah. we're in the greatest country we're in america guys That's you know right. you know and to see her, her the way she approached life and the way life is she never said life has been tough on me life has been rough on me because i didn't know my mother she don't remember her mother i mean because she was like five or six and pretty much raised herself, yeah. and, and and then and I, and I think that's another another reason they became very charitable along the way. When they had a little extra money, they would take it back to the people in need, and that's yeah. that's important. I think so. You're also saying a thing. I hope people are hearing. I'm glad I'm hearing it. Like I'm selfish, really. 
because I'm learning a lot here too, or it's reminding me to think about things in this way. You learn a whole lot from just what seeing what your parents do or how they act or how they talk. Like, I bet your mom's not purposely teaching you to be tough, to appreciate what you have, but she just did it, so you do it. We're like, I don't know what else to do. I, my mom never did complain. Right. She had a really tough, she had a tough go of it. And sometimes we, I think we got to start appreciating the tough go a little bit more. Like the tough goes is actually, it's actually okay. It, it helps you in ways that, that are hard and not always fun, but it absolutely does. And, and you try to, you try to take that to your kids. And I do that to my kids when they start complaining, like if it's if it's about sports or or, or, or what's basically like, like something extracurricular. I said, you have a choice. You can quit and find something else. Find a passion that you want to do. Yeah. Don't 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 just because dad likes it. You find your passion and quit complaining about. And, and my kids know not to complain pretty much. They don't. They, they, they really don't. Because yeah. I'll get on to them. And that's 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 the key. I said, the easiest thing in the world is to complain. Don't complain. Find a passion of what you like and go do it. And, and and if they can do that, I think they can be successful, productive citizens of our society. And that's all we want for people, to be productive citizens. Whatever job it is, be productive, Yeah, you know, in our society. Man, that's so true. Everybody looks at things and thinks you're not successful if you don't meet some expectation. Bill Gates, uh, Warren Buffett. I don't know. I'm just naming off super wealthy people like that really has no bearing right. on how productive you are of a person a human in this world Correct. in your society in your community i was thinking about this the other day the world is so big and it really doesn't matter outside of your community your family the close people you get to see each and every day right i mean there's another neil and Juve sitting in a podcast booth in minnesota somewhere <laughs> right. but who knows i don't know them you don't know them. right they're just doing their thing we, all we can do is do our thing and try to be really positive uh assets to our community that's exactly right yeah you, you got that exactly right so are you competitive we try to be competitive why I, do you say I, wait I, i'm saying are you who they I think you are I think any everybody's competitive in whatever they 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 want to be competitive. I think it, whether it's academic, sports, whatever it is, yeah. at my job, I'm very competitive. Yeah, I think we all that's just our nature. What is your job? I work for Texas Bank here in Comanche and I, and I am the president of the local branch here in Comanche. Been here about 4 years. Yeah. Uh let me just tell you a little secret folks. You don't get to be president if you're not competitive. <laughs> like you don't get those responsibilities that you don't get to another level of uh, career if you don't have a little competitive fire in you that says, yeah, I'm going to stay here late today and get these things done. I'm going to work hard on, I'm going to make sure I know this, whatever it is, frontwards, backwards, sideways, so I'm not going to get stumped. I'm going to look like I know what I'm doing in front of anybody you put me in front of. That's competitive. I got this sneaky suspicion Juve's really competitive. Why I'm asking this question is I want to get to, but I never see you going off screaming at the ball game, hollering at the refs, stomping off, throwing your chair at the fence or any of that stuff. Where, where You know, a lot of how do you do that? How do you keep that composure? And even though I know you've got competitive <laughs> nature in you. <laughs> you know what? Uh, but the way, kind of the way I said, look at it earlier, if if my son or my daughter's out there competing and, and it, it's her time, it's not my time, it's her time. Now, the one time I get on to them is if you're being lazy, and that's gonna, and they're gonna hear it at home, and they know not to be lazy. If if the ball's stolen and they take one little break, they know that I'm gonna be on them, and they're gonna say, look, you need to quit, you need to be more competitive. You're gonna get that happen to you. But you got to keep on fighting. Yeah. And if you keep on fighting, it's, a, it's too late for me to be screaming at you, whether you scored or you made a mistake. It's too late for me to be screaming. I mean, that, that's a coach's job. That's not my job. I mean, that's what he gets paid to do it. I'm not going to be screaming at you, telling you what to do. I don't know what you're supposed to do. Yeah. I don't go to your practices. So I'm not going to yell at you. There's there's a deal on, on um, 
a coach from Cincinnati uh, that, that talks perfect. I think he was a head coach at Cincinnati, or he talks it perfect. He said, "You see, these coaches don't get paid much. These referees don't get paid much." And, they, and he says, "They're doing. They know what they're doing. I don't need to get involved." Yeah. And I don't. I. I, I this is their time. It's not my time. It's kind of like my son. He he loves stock showing. That he found a passion in stock showing. I hated it with a passion. Yeah. And he knew it, but I supported him. And 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 he got to the point where he didn't want me involved in any of it. I never really got involved in any of it. And, and I, we're at stock show uh, this week, uh, last this year. And the, the the ag teacher said, "Let me help you out." He starts blowing his animal, and he goes, "No, sir." This is my animal. Don't mess with it. He yeah. kind of moved, <laughs> politely moved around the way. So if you find a passion for what you do, you don't need me to be screaming at you. Go get it. Go. You're going to go do it on your own, whatever it is. And that's why I never scream at my kids. Now, if they get lazy at home, they're going to hear. They're going to hear the the brunt of it. And, and and they said, don't 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 waste the coach's time, and don't waste my time. Just go. But if you want to enjoy it and go compete, go compete. Your kids all strike me as pretty. Uh calm competitors too i'm gonna let's just take jess for example she pitches in softball that's a pretty pressure position uh man that girl she just never seems rattled am i missing it is she rattled and i just don't get it but she just takes such a good attitude towards it how did you is that naturally her or is that something y'all work on <coughs> Well, uh, that that's naturally her, because I'm going back to she enjoys it and she wants that 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 competition. She wants to be the one, even though sometimes she don't work as hard as I think she needs to. But she wants she wants to do it, and that's her doing it. And yeah, she don't get rattled. Actually, we're gonna go play in a softball tournament tomorrow, and 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 uh, and I, I called a friend of mine and said, "Hey, do y'all need a uh, a player?" She goes, oh, "No, no. Do you know anybody needs a player for this tournament in Dublin?" He goes, no, but uh, I know somebody that does. So we went to practice last night, and it was a 14U team. And I'm worried, and I say, Jess, uh, you don't have to go. He goes, I'm ready, Dad. I'm ready for 14U, which I don't – it worried me a little bit, but we're going to try it this week. And, and she didn't get rattled. I thought she would get intimidated by those older girls. And, no, she just – she's a little bitty girl and got these big girls. And, yeah. And, and, and she's not much better or, or worse than them, but, but, but she wants to compete at that level. And, 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 and she's not – and come tomorrow when we play, she's not going to get rattled. She would just go out there and have fun. And that's what, that's what the kid loves to do. And if the kid loves to do it, I think the worst thing as a parent is forcing the kid to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, back back I'll, I'll go back to to my son. He 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 couldn't handle the heat. Baseball was not his sport, so he was about 13 years old. And I said, "Son, you're gonna have to find something else." And they said, "Dad, can we go competition swimming?" And he found it on his own. So we were competing with the South South Lakes of the world and all the Metroplex, and we we're going to this big pool area, it's kind of like an Olympic pool. And he got to the point where he was really he was really good, and he enjoyed it. Because he liked, that's what he liked. And I never had to get on to him, hey, you go go practice or you got to go to practice. It's it's fun to see kids find a passion to what they do. Not what dad or mom, sometimes you want them to do what you what you like yeah, to do. You do. Right. But, but they got to find a passion of what they enjoy to do. And they'll do good at it. And, and they, they will. Yeah. And especially if you got some good adults that will help them along the way and they figure out that these kids have a passion, they'll do good at it. Mm -hmm. and, and and we've been very fortunate with, with my son Robert and, and, and my next one coming up, Emily, so and Jess too. Yeah, Emily's impressive the same way. Like they all just seem to they just kinda are quiet, hard working. The kind of kid I think every coach is like, Give me some more of that. You well, know? well, I don't know about that, but I always tell them I, I got a sign in my house is always be humble. So yeah. that's that's because you never know when this world will bring you down. So that's uh, and and I, and that's something I teach my kids: always be humble. Yeah, you know, um, you're not the worst or the best at anything, and that's just the truth of it. When you really start stacking it up, I mean, I try to think like Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. Tiger Woods, right. They might actually be the best. Like Tiger oh, might yes. actually be the very best golf player ever. Yeah. But I don't know. It's arguable he's not, you know. So, I mean, you, it's hard to say any one person's ever going to get that accolade. You're the very best that's ever lived or ever going to live at this thing. Don't, don't even try for that. Right. <laughs> Go be humble. Realize you're not. Go be the best you can be. Maximize your potential. 
Don't try to be somebody else. Just maximize what you can do. Because that probably takes you a lot farther than you can even dream. Right, right. Oh, do your kids, so this is a personal thing here, or I'm like, seriously, you're making me kind of want to be better, which is good. My kid, has, has one of your kids ever said to you, Dad, you never tell me I did good. All you ever do is tell me I did bad. Have they ever said that? Because that's what I get a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, with the way I usually follow it up, the way I usually handle those, because I've, I've had those comments and I try to avoid those comments, but I always critique some, the negative and then come back, finish off with a positive. Yeah. And, it, and, and I said, look, you're going to have to, you know, look at the ball better. But I like that slide you did at, at, at mm-hmm. home plate. That was impressive. And then and then they kind of, in their mind, that's the way I do it. Their mind says, okay, dad wants me to focus on this a little bit better, but he likes this part of my yeah. game. So there, it kind of gives them a little bit of hope. But Well, and, and, and then and, I think it also ties back to their passion for it. Mm-hmm. Like, if they love it, they want to hear what I can do to be, be better. better. They want to hear <laughs> it. it yes. does, they don't. See, when they're doing it just to make daddy proud of them, they want to hear that daddy's proud of them. Right. And if they're not getting that, man, that's a wake up moment for me right there. My kids may be doing things because I want them to do it, not because they want them. They want to do it. So I got to really look into that. I think everybody take a second, ask yourself that question. Right. You know, is that, is that a truth in your family or in your life in your relationship with your kids? It is for me. I don't know that's black and white exactly. It's probably gray in some ways. Like they probably do still like it, but are they really truly passionate about it? And it all goes back really to, you know, the, uh, you personally as your, as your, whatever your career is and, and, and being a community banker is important to me to try to help out this community, whatever, which way I can. And, you know, I couldn't go work in Waco or in Dallas. I, I guess I would if I had to, but, but, you know, you kind of feel like you make a difference a little bit in this community just by some of the things that you do. And you don't have to publicize it. You don't have to. You you know, you yourself know. And I and I, I was driving through town the other day, and I said, man, there's, I counted about three or four customers that started at the very bottom, and now they've been very successful. And that's what you, you as, as a community banker say, hey, you were a little bit a part of that, of their success to make a difference in, in your hometown, in your community. And that's what that's what the, I go back to my kids is finding that passion that you enjoy to do. If you want to go to Minnesota or or Alaska and be the best, I don't know, whatever you know, do ice it. Ice fisherman, the ice fisherman, whatever, yeah. go do it. But do it that you that you enjoy. Get up every morning and enjoy what you like to do. Yeah. And and that because you know sometimes you may have a high paid job and you got to get up and oh, I don't want to go today. You know, and, and and that transcends to to the to the people you work you work that work under you you start giving them some positive vibes and come on, let's go. And, and all of a sudden, you know, your customer service is better and, and things get started getting better from, you know, because they see you as a leader. And, and if you show up late, you know, or, or, or leaving all the time and, and, and showing you're not being productive, they're going to say, man, he's not, you know, our boss not doing his part. So I think you have to also be a leader at, at work just yeah. like you do at home. Absolutely. I mean, it all, it's all this, meshed together thing home work marriage yes definitely (laughs) (laughs) that's the most challenging (laughs) it really is i mean because there's so much dynamic in in merging a couple of humans Mm -hmm. into a marriage and into a successful financial relationship parenting relationship emotional relationship all of those things um you kind of learn when they, uh, when your wife uh, is getting ready for the morning, puts on a dress, and says, "How do I look? What do you say? You look good." You're not gonna say, "No, nah, you never, you know, <laughs> you're not, you're not gonna say what." Yeah, well, you got <laughs> enough ki- uh, daughters too, right? I've got three daughters. You got a couple of them, right? I mean, it's so dynamic, and I'll try to be quiet. I'll be like, "Looks good." Uh, and then tell it, me what you think. Oh, I don't know. It looks good. Careful. It looks you gotta, good. <laughs> you got to be careful. You got to be careful. Then what else, which I feel kind of lucky because they've started being that kind of sounding board for each other. No, that doesn't look good. And yeah. they 
take it really good. Yeah, you, you got to be careful how you say it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. You can't just say it right away. And then they can say, take that ridiculous shirt off right now. Put something on better. Okay. Yeah, sure. I don't care. Yeah. Although my wife would argue that I do because one of our – we were at a food show or something, and she went early in our marriage, or maybe we were even just dating. I can't remember. Maybe we are married. Anyways, we were serious about it. She went and bought me a bunch of clothes. But I came, put them on, and then never wore them or told her I didn't like them. She had to take them back, you know, like that hurt her. That's not going to be something she ever forgets. Not, it's not like this thing she can't forgive me for, but it is a little bit painful when somebody you really care about doesn't appreciate this nice thing you, you did for them or right. your, <laughs> your, your opinion. Right, right. Right. It's okay. You live through it, and that's fine. Like, I didn't love the clothes. They, I mean, for whatever reason, I was about to say a minute ago, I don't care what I wear. I would wear what any, whatever, <laughs> but that's obviously not true. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so why banking? So what'd you go? Were you like, did you just love math, money? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed math in school. When I was an eighth grader, Archie Boyd, I don't even remember Archie. I've heard the name of He bunch. was a counselor, and he was in eighth grade, and he and I remember pulling me aside, and he says, you need to get these. I just want to get the, the simplest classes in high school. He said, no, you need to take uh, algebra, algebra one. I don't know if they had calculus back then. I don't know, but it's geometry. I said, you need to take all these maths. I said, I don't want to do it. He says, yes, you do. You need to take them because you may help you in college. And as I took them in high school, I was good. I realized that I was I was okay at math. I was good at math. And, and, uh, and so – it was kind of interesting. Kenneth Hager was the president at Comanche National at the time. So every summer I'd go visit him as an 18 year old, 19 year old, 20 year old and says, Hey, I'm going to college one day. I'd like to go work, come back or here at Comanche National. So I graduated from A&M and I have a good, had a good job with a, a pizza company. We made all the pizza food for our pizza meat for pizza hut Domino's. And, and I was a transportation guy that, that coordinated all that. And they called me right when my job was peaking where I was at in the Metroplex so I come here for an interview and uh, I took the job and it took me about three months to come to Comanche because I was having doubts. Did I want to come back to my hometown? Finally, one day they called me and said, are you coming or what? And I said, yes, sir. It was Jerry Vine. So I'll be there in two weeks because it had been three <laughs> week, three months since I accepted the job. And, and, and that's how I ended up being a banker. And then and then it took me a while to, uh, to you know, Comanche is tough. Comanche is tough to come back after you've been gone for a while. It's it, it can be tough, you know. There's not many people your age that you know that are single, and who do you hang around with? And but it took me a while to adjust, and I did, and and and, and that's why I ended up staying at Command State for about 20 years, and then and then moved over to the Texas Bank. Yeah. So how did you meet the misses? We well, we actually were were really good friends in high school, and, and actually. Uh, I'd come for the summer. I'd take her out to uh, to lunch, and, and I'd, I kept on saying, you need to go to A&M, you need to go to A&M. So we were always really good friends. And and one day, one of our good friends, um, Andy Lane, had, it, it was her wedding, and we talked on the phone for about two hours. He says, do you want to go to her wedding? I said, sure. So we just went as friends, so we dated. We, we actually were friends for – went out as friends for about six months till we started dating. So yeah. I just had a lot of respect for her, and, and, and so we kind of knew each other – when we were like 17 or 18 and, and, and then later on, you know, after college started communicating, never thought of, of, of never saw her as a wife, but, right. but once we got to know each other, we, you know, yeah, that's how, that's yeah. what it ended yeah. up being. Uh, well, probably probably that, a little similar to your story. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah Similarly, you know. like, it's cool to get to marry somebody you really known your whole life I mean, right. for such a long time. Like, she knows everything about you. You know everything about her. You know each other's families. I mean, all that stuff helps make all that merging a little bit easier because you understand before you ever get started a lot about it. Not everything, but at least right. a big portion of it. <laughs> right, right, right. So, folks, I don't know. That's this. We're not marriage counselors or anything. <laughs> or, I'm I trying mean, to be. Even date, dating <laughs> counselors, yeah. but... I think it is valuable to think about when you're in that time in your life looking for somebody to to do this thing together with. Keep that in mind. Like friends from a long time ago, they're a pretty good place to look. Somebody that you just 
you just have a good time with or just the kind of person you enjoy have similar interests and those kind of things that's a good place to start looking best looking but doesn't really (laughs) matter that much (laughs) although it's okay but it's not the biggest thing (laughs) in the puzzle um so tell me a little bit about the banking industry these days i mean this is june 2023 we got some inflationary times going on business is tough what's it like being a banker uh, you know i think the most things are regulations how we're getting regulated more than we ever have been and and banks are the expense of, of the regulations and hiring people in compliance and continue to make sure that you know you have fair lending i mean you document everything that you do that you used to, when i started in banking you didn't have to do none of that so it's it's gotten tougher that the and but I, I truly believe there's a niche for community banking uh in and, and you talk about the relationships yeah and and i think that's important in our communities and and it, it's i think it's always been tough in these communities no no matter what they like you said earlier that that farmer and rancher's not he's not doing it because he's making millions he's doing it because he's got a passion for it yeah and he enjoys what he does and and, and, be, and being a community banker you kind of have a little bit of input in that and it's never good these these communities are never going to be successful with billionaires and that kind of stuff but we got to continue to to go forward and, and try to support each other as a community and continue to grow together. And like you said earlier, we, you know, we, nobody knows what they're doing but us in our little communities, and we got to right. make them better. And that's all we can do: try to make them better. And and that's what and and you know, and I learned that a long you know. I'll tell you a quick story. I learned that a long time ago. It's one of the mo- a lot of pride I have in Comanche is when I first came here. Jim Wilkerson was probably one of the very first persons that welcomed me to Comanche. And Jim was my community best friend. I saw him every day before he passed away about five years ago. But but Jim Jim and Nancy were just they always would welcome me and help me and and we would go to every football every road football game with Jim, H R Jeffries, Doc Calhoun, I think Bill Parker might have been one year before he passed away. And I went and I was the young guy going with these guys, and that's the greatest generation ever in my opinion. And I saw how those guys cared about your community yeah. and they supported your community. And it was funny to see those guys. They would almost try to beat each other up in the car. And then later on, they were like best friends. Yeah. And, and you know, <laughs> and, 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 and Lance was in there sometimes. And But it was it was funny. I was the young guy just learning. I was just trying to absorb how these guys did it. And, and those guys were kind of my community heroes because they they kind of they kind of cherished and, 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 and really – preserve this community and try to make it better they, they didn't care about you would see jim Wilkerson at every community function and he wasn't because you know he was he, he was jim Wilkerson. he was there to see what was going on how to make our community better hr jeffries was another guy with, you know one of the best superintendents that we've had yeah you know doc Calhoun, a world war ii veteran with 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 a lot of history and those guys knew how to make our community better and i think we're missing that in today's world, we become a little bit more. It's funny in the last twenty years, how we kind of a little more selfish, yeah, a little bit. And and those guys weren't to me. I never saw the the, the selfish in those guys. Those guys were about our community, yeah, and enjoyed what you know, getting on that suburban and just sit in the back seat. And I don't think I said a word the whole time. Just I just sit there and just try to listen to those guys talk most of the time. That's so. That's a great story. I'm jealous of that story because those are some guys that would be just so fun wouldn't it be nice to get them in back in the suburban and take one more trip you know just just to have though that relationship that access to their thought that's really what the podcast is about i hope people listen and they think you know i like Juve. i don't know him well but i get a chance to hear how he thinks about stuff on this podcast this is like riding in the back seat of that suburban for somebody. Right. They can hear how you think about it. Now, look, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but you're getting a little older now. Mm-hmm. Now there's some younger guys in the back seat looking and paying attention and thinking, cool, I, I like that. I want to think about the community that way when I get an opportunity to. So that's really cool. It's fun how life can work like that. I'm glad you mentioned Jim, Doc. Uh, Mr. Jeffries and those guys because they're gone. They're not here anymore, but they still live through these stories, through our how we act because they taught us how to act that way. Right, right. All right, so banking, you know, is it tough? Like, outside of the regulations, 
are banks just making a lot of money these days? Is it do banks actually live in this world that is just kind of a consistent make money all the time, maybe not a lot, but never none? <laughs> well, that, I don't know if I want to answer that question, but you know, <laughs> well, don't answer it if you don't want no, to. No, I, I don't mind answering. I, I think we have gotten too uh, too greedy to a point, uh, and 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 our, and I'm not saying that. You know, I'm I'm talking like like the big 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 banks, and 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 they've forgotten about communities, and I think you know we got to take care of each other, yeah. and you got to find. And we're fortunate in Comanche that we still have a lot of. Com- I think we have some great community bankers, and we have some great community banks. You know, one one of the guys I learned a lot from, Jeff Stewart, great community banker, and and, and he showed me a lot about how to be a better community minded person. And, and and my current boss, Greg Dodd. You know, those guys are community guys, and 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 I like working for those kind of guys. As long as those guys have that mentality, they're going to make our communities better. Yeah. And and, and so you got to have people that have that mentality because. If you start thinking, well, I care for the money, and yeah, the money is, is important, of course, but you also got to care for your community. You you can't turn your back on that on, on on relationships that you built along the way. Yeah, I think there was a phrase one time that that somebody said that, and I'll never forget it. They asked a the banker, says, "How do you make money?" They said, "Well, I make money to uh, I sell money to make money." Yeah, and, and then the the other one asked the back, "How do you make money?" Well, I sell relationships to make money and that's what our community is about yeah i've i've not got the greatest relationship with bankers because and mainly i think it's the regulations you're talking about yes there's a lot of regulations you got all these regulations like hey i need some money i'm gonna pay it back if i don't pay it back come take everything i got Mm -hmm. but until i don't pay it back just give me the money well, now, no, we need financial statements and da da da, all these things. Oh yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it, it, and if you don't get that, you're gonna get written up, and it's it's amazing how, how who audits that. Yeah. I mean, so when these loan officers are getting all this stuff from me, I almost think I could just send a blank piece of paper or some piece of paper with gibberish on it. Uh, is somebody actually or is there some checklist somewhere that somebody says yes we have this we have this we have this we're not necessarily worried about what that says exactly right now unless but we need to have this this and this so our butt's covered in case this loan defaults am i thinking about that right or is the loan officer actually really uh auditing or paint or, or looking through these financials to know something you, you know one thing that's that's a big uh advantage of working in a community bank you pretty much know a lot about a lot of people and you and when you see a financial statement you say okay that's close enough or you may go out there and just check to make sure it's close enough yeah so most of the people you know now somebody new comes in you kind of you know after like i'm i'm a seasoned banker you kind of interview you got to do some research the internet you can do a lot of research yeah and you can also submit a, a form through irs to verify some of that documentation so you, you there's you treat every situation different well that's the business isn't that, 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 that's it i mean the, you're selling money to make money you don't want to make a bad deal right so i understand that anyways it's still just and, a pain and, and sometimes and, and you got to have the certain documentation because if you don't they're going to come back and say hey you missed a, a cash flow you missed a financial statement you missed you know whatever you missed you didn't perfect this loan correctly now what are we going to do and 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 i'll I'll go back to bank in the last six months the amount of fraud that we're seeing in our industry has been incredible really we have we have seen just there at texas bank every day there's somebody that gets fraud because they see an ad hey get free click on it yeah win a free cooler at at ace hardware and, and, and then they get their information and it's and they got all kind. They got extremely creative. We last couple of weeks we had one that, uh, two of them that they took over their cell phone. They could put whatever they could on their cell phone. They took over their online banking. It's crazy how how much fraud. And we got to constantly watch that. And oh yeah. I had a, had a ten thousand dollar cashier counterfeit check the other day that I put. Luckily I put a hold. The guy was upset. Well it came back. 
And so I said, look, sir, he came back and then he didn't say nothing. So I said, We're <laughs> yeah, right. and, 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 and unfortunately, in those cases, you got to close their account because you don't know if he did it intentionally or not intentionally. And you don't want to deal with a customer like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want honest, honest customers. And, and sometimes you can kind of tell if somebody's making an honest mistake or somebody's trying to get you. So you it, banking has gotten tougher because of all the fraud and all the and all the compliance. And, and, and then there, a lot of the folks don't understand what's behind banking today's and they said well i can't go to him and just get like you said go get a loan signature loan like i could or or just give him a blank application he's gonna ask for this and this you know a financial statement a cash flow three years tax returns you know it's because the way our industry has has become and and banks are getting like i said heavy heavy, more and more heavily regulated you said something really interesting to me there i want people listening to think about build a relationship with your banker like get to know one like it's gonna it's be painful early on while you're getting to know them but go stick with them work with them then maybe sometime down the road all this stuff gets a little easier because both of you you understand what i'm up to i understand what you need and it all this flows so much easier do you have any like let's assume our kids are listening or college age kids are listening and they don't have a bank account or they don't have never took a loan i think that's super important to 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 get a young person into the system in some way early as possible am i right about that how do you feel about that from your seat you know we actually as i was leaving the bank there was a 16 year old opening account today a high school girl then we had one this morning so i think if you start them at 15 my 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 daughter's 15 years old she has a bank she has a bank account she has a debit card she hasn't started working yet but she gets christmas money she gets birthday money she chores around the house and and, and i show her says you cannot be overdrawn you got to make sure you got online banking you can do everything online now yeah you never have to show up to the bank anymore so, so that it's one of those situations that, that everybody, you need, I think if you start them around the 13, 14, 15 year old age, where they can kind of understand the concept of managing your money, that's very important. Why don't we teach that in school? Uh, you know, I don't, in a bigger way. I, I, I do not know. I, I you know, I, I used to go to the schools. I went, I think last time I went was three or four. I'll tell you another story about this school. I went there about four years ago and I was teaching them how to do a car loan. And I could see a few kids were interested. And, 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 and then finally I said, here's a business loan. And, I, and it was a welder. How do you become a welder in Comanche with your own business? And there was a young man laying back. And he just laying back. He didn't even pay attention. And then I say, a business plan for a welding. He gets up and he starts asking questions. Now, he's, he's our customer now at Texas Bank. He's yeah. an independent welder. I don't know if that, I don't know if that changes his, his, his philosophy of what he was going to do once he graduated. But he's got a, a successful young he's, he's probably 22, 23 years, but he's, he seems like he's got a good little business going on his own, and and, and it, it got his attention. So, yes, we need to teach more of that in school, the budgeting, the financing, the opportunities. There's kids for out there, but I think the most important thing is budgeting. If kids know how to budget early on in life, even if you go on to college, you already got a head start. Yeah. Uh, you know, and when I went to college, I don't know, you know, that's when I learned the most about budgeting. You know, the first year I kind of got a little crazy because you didn't, nobody taught you. And after that, I said, whoa, I can't do this every year. I got to figure out a way to budget a little bit better, you know? So you kind of slowed down a little bit, you know? You got to learn. Yeah. I can't have ribeye steak every night. That's exactly right. I can't have Nike Air Jordan shoes. Like, that stuff, I'm just pulling some of this stuff out of the air. Right. It was high. It's stuff I remember from my life as high-dollar things I couldn't have. Right. You know, uh, ribeye steak, I guess I could. We we raised cattle. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got plenty of that. <laughs> yeah, we had, we had lots of that. But Air Jordans, these high dollar penny loafer type shoes, I don't know, super fancy belts, some kind of jewelry. Just these things. That's right. You can't have it all. Like you got to learn that and you got to figure out how to budget for those things. Save. If you really want it, save. That's a story of mine. In college, I worked, washed dishes in the cafeteria for a whole year so I could buy a saddle. Right. I wanted a saddle. Right. So I did that. I mean, my friends were going out doing all these things. I'm like, nah, I got to go to the dish. I'm going to wash dishes. 
It was a great lesson for me. I look back at that really fondly. I think that's one of the best lessons college teaches you. If 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 you take it on is budgeting, and if you come out of there, and you learn how to budget, you'll be very successful. Yeah. At whatever you do in life, and I agree with you. They need to teach that more in our schools, and and, and teach these kids how to budget. You know, it's not not the paper, you know, checkbook anymore because these kids oh, yeah. don't use that's that. Done. No, that's done. Nobody uses that anymore. There's still a few customers who use that, but. But these kids, they're not going to use that. They want everything electronic. And, and the good thing about online banking nowadays, I mean, you can do everything. It's about anything you want. You can do a stop payment online banking. You can increase your, your limit on your credit card. You can kill your debit card with online I, banking. I pretty much and don't go to the bank You don't need all. to go. You really, it gets to the point where you don't need to go. Our ATMs, you know, you can get cash out. You can make a deposit on ATM. So, <laughs> so you can pretty much do anything you want without going to the bank nowadays. Yep. Uh, so it's, it's become very easy. And if you can teach these kids how to do it and it's kind of interesting uh today uh, me and my assistant were talking about it like a lot of our customers are still young customers coming in yeah and, and i don't know if they're being they like to come in or but they're still coming in a lot of the younger customers sure. like, just like these young men that's well, 22 it, years it old changes like i think ever like every generation starts acting a little differently because they want that relationship again or i had it a lot when i was a kid so I'm a little more comfortable not doing it. But I'm telling my parents, they're not going to do nothing online. They don't trust it. They think they're all their money's going to get stolen. They want to go hand it to somebody at the bank that can take it. What about credit? Uh, what about building credit? How do you do that? Is it important anymore? Oh, and one other funny thing right before we go to credit. I, I'd pay it with a check at the feed store, my bill. I don't know why. I just do. There was a young kid that works out there. He said, oh, wow, a check. I've never seen one of those. I mean, it was the funniest <laughs> thing. It's like he was seeing some kind of a unicorn creature or something. Yeah, yeah. Checks, man, I've heard about those. Well, now with Venmo and all those apps, yeah. that's, that's, that's eliminated all the checks. You know, I, yeah. I was at a softball game one day, and the umps are getting Venmo in the middle of the plate but right before about to start the game. Yeah, you know, that's right. There's no cash exchange anymore. So, yeah, so yeah that's, that's why checks are being eliminated. We, there's still people that use checks, but it's less and less, yeah. you know. What about credit? Credit. I think you start credit at a young age. Um, you know, legally you're, you, you cannot have a contract signed until you're 18, but a lot of times, you know, mom and dad will come in and, and says, I want to get them started on my credit, you know, we'll wait till they're 18 and, and, and they'll co-sign for them for a vehicle or, or a CD loan. They'll put their own money to kind of get them started. And, and as you go to college, you can start those credit cards, those small credit cards Yeah. that, and, and as, long, as long as you don't have to pay it off every month, your credit starts to build. It's not going to be overnight. Credit is not going to happen overnight. It just time is yep. all you need but i think you should need to start once you turn 18 start looking at having your credit because they don't report to your 18 anyway the credit bureau doesn't so having that credit having a checking account at a young age is always good for a bank to say hey this person's taking care of their account they're good by the time you're 20 21 you've already had an account with five six years with this bank they'll see that our community bank will see that and say hey this person has done well with their account they haven't had any hot checks they know how to manage yeah. their budget so the credit is very important. And also credit, everybody nowadays, and it used to not be this, everybody looks at credit score. I mean, some banks will give you a loan, but your credit score is going, if you got a low credit score, you're going to be 20% interest or 18% interest. And that's going to cost you money if you have yeah. bad credit. And if you have good credit, you're going to get the, you know, the cheaper interest. You're going to save money. So take care of your credit is very, very important. Ah, you that's, know. that's so, such preach, Hoover, preach. Yeah. It costs you more money to have bad credit, so value good credit. Value the budget. Value the truth. You can't have that. Don't put. Don't run your credit cards up and not pay them off. It, like these things, everybody's got to think about. Uh, I had a guest on. His name was Stephen Barden. He said, Neil, I try to get my interns to think about future Neil. Like think about future Juve. Future Juve is not going to want to pay high interest on everything, especially when he's also now he's borrowing money for bigger things in business and this kind of stuff. Yeah. That high interest builds quick. Anyways, I just think that's a great concept. If you're, I don't know, I don't, you could be any age just now starting your credit uh, building, uh, I guess, journey. But 
really you should value that you got to really think about it and take care of it early if credit's you care, worth money it's gonna it's gonna be you know your future yep and and like you said later on you get married you find a house find a car you know those things you want them at a cheaper rate and you don't want them at that higher interest rate where it's going to cost you money yep. because of decisions you made and, and like i said a lot of them at a certain point they won't even touch your credit anymore they just say no yeah you're gonna have a certain credit score 620 630 is kind of the credit score if you're 700 and above usually you're pretty good at credit Below 620, a lot of a lot of companies will say, "No, we you're gonna have to get your credit higher." Yeah. And the few that will touch it, they'll just charge the heck out of you. They, sure. They'll make they're gonna make their money. Yeah. <laughs> they're gonna make and their then money. you end up not being able to pay because you're paying so much interest. Right. Right. And then right. it just hurts your credit. It's just kind of this vicious spiral to the bottom. What else? What else have we not talked about? Well, I, I think we pretty much covered a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, in, in you short know, that's period all time. fun. We covered a lot, covered our communities, our families, and, and, and uh, banking. Banking is not the most uh, uh, entertaining subject. Well, <laughs> you know, most bankers are pretty boring, I would say. You know? <laughs> it's super valuable. It's super integral. But, but it's very valuable in your, in your daily life is yeah. what it is. You know, most, Building yeah. a business, any of those things. And that's what I tell my kids. Like I said, both my kids, older kids have accounts, and, and I said, take care of it. You, see, you don't want you don't want the banker's kid to be overdrawn because I'm gonna come after you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, that's right. Especially where we work, where I work at, you don't want me. You don't want to be overdrawn. Where I, <laughs> that is not a I'm good. I'm going to hear about it. Yeah, yeah, we're going to hear about it. So uh, that's uh, that's very very important. Well, Jose, I appreciate you coming here. I'm just thinking. I'm taking a second just to say, man, was there anything else that I really wanted? I really, I got to ask about, you know, where your calm demeanor comes from. What is your favorite sport? Like you said, Robert wanted to swim, and Emily, I see you play basketball pretty good. Jess Lee's pitching. Do you just like anything they're playing, or do you got one you like? <laughs> There's one time out of the year that that, that uh, it's my fight in Texas Aggies when I'm there on TV. I run everybody out of the living room. I said, okay, get it. I, my phone gets disconnected because I want nobody to call me in the middle of the game. And I sit there, and I, that's the only time I watch sports to watch the A&M, A&M football. Yeah, there and, you go. And, I mean. so, and, of course, supporting our Comanche Indians. I've been on the chain gang for over 20 years and supporting the Comanche Indians and seeing what uh, Coach Escobar has done with these group of kids. We talk about community and, and what he's done. It's I love it. I love Me too. You, you know, you see – I, I, I told him, I said, Coach, you're that one percent coach that we have in the high school. You're the key. You're the coach that shows up at four thirty in the morning. You have the passion. Yeah. And when we talk about going back to passion, I said, I love to see what you're doing with these kids, and these kids are getting their butts worked hard, and they're loving it. Yeah, they're loving it, and and, and that's that's what those things are important in your communities. So, but anyway, going back football, football, Comanche High School. And 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 my on TV, and that's angles. the only time I'll, I'll, I'll watch TV. I'm I won't. telling you, I went to Tech, so <clears throat> I wasn't the biggest fan of AM. I also went down there to a basketball camp and had us walked on the grass in the wrong place or something, and a college kid just scared to pee out of me, like he's fixing to beat me down <laughs> right here. So, anyways, I was just scared of AM a little bit. Plus, anyways, mom and dad went to Tech, so I was right. Lubbock right. worked out really good for me. It was a great place for me. It was perfect. I loved it. But Peterson's sponsored right, I've seen that. football down there. So I got to get on the field. I got to go on the field during a yell practice. And really, that is some incredible stuff. Like that 12th man, the, the history, the yell leaders, all that stuff around a- a- Aggie football. And really all sports down there, but football specifically. Right. It's cool. I mean, it is cool. It's, man. Hard. It, it, yeah. it's fun to go to those games and 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 and, and hear the fans and as loud as it's been and yeah. and you know there's there's uh, six Aggies in our family already now, so we all sometimes get together down there and and and, and my brother will tailgate and invite the family over and we'll show up and 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 uh, he 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 has season tickets and and I only go maybe once a year, but you know he. We all have a good time and 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 and, and enjoy watching Aggie football. If I'm yeah. not watching it on the TV, I'll, I'll go watch it that one time out of the year. Yeah, now, live. So, so yeah. what does one do? Because Mr. Wilson said something about he worked for Text Dot or something. Is that right? Wrong? Or? Juan started at Text Dot. Now he works for a company called Freezing Nickels out of San Antonio. Juan has done really well for himself. He 
he one of his first project was a tee here at, in Brownwood. He was involved in that design. He designed the, the North Loop in Granbury. Yeah. He he was he was the chief designer in that one. Uh, about three years ago, he designed the uh, one of the terminals in DFW. Uh, really. One of the new terminals, yes. And right now he's designing a new one in San Antonio. And he lives in San Antonio, and and Juan is a uh, high energy guy still. He loves to drive. He'll leave Fort, he'll leave San Antonio at three in the morning, show up in Fort Worth, and 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 he's still working sixteen, seventeen hours a day. And he just I don't know where he gets his energy. He still <laughs> yeah. I guess when he was very little, yeah. and he had, and he and going back to his old story, he's got passion of what what he loves to do, and and so he, he that's that's what he enjoys to do, and and and. And he does, does really well at it. Yeah, and, that's right. And, and and so I think he's been with that company for about oh about ten years or eight years, something like that, with freezing nickels and 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 just kind of goes all. He was involved with the um, uh, Houston, the big mix, mix master in Houston. He was involved in redesigning that one too a few years ago. So yeah, he stays constantly busy. That's impressive to me because I look at those mix masters, I look at these airport terminals, even even just big buildings. I'm like, man. How do they figure out how to do that? Mm -hmm. How do they know this road's passing over that road and then that's going to loop back around over? Somebody like Juan is sitting there and (laughs) has the brain for it to say, ah, this is how we're going to make all this work. You know, it's kind of funny. You know, even as a kid, he would build bridges with his toys and had a little bridge and put water and sand and and he would design all these little bridges with his toys and and then one time went there and crushed his bridge. Oh, yeah. oh. He beat the heck out of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was funny, but he didn't think it was yeah. funny. So, because I was about five and he was about ten, and he beat the heck out of me that time. So, because I crushed his bridge, I just thought it'd be funny just to crush his bridge, and he spent a lot of time with it. So. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It wasn't funny. Hey, thanks again, well, everybody. Thank be a part of your community. If you see Juve on the street, give him a high five. Tell him, hey man, keep it up. We appreciate you. There's lots of us looking up to you. Thanks for being on the podcast, everybody. If you've listened this long, you've now spent well we're well over an hour. We've been wow. talking here wow. uh, about things that are important to us. I think they'll be important to you. If if nothing else, you're spending a lot of time, which is your really your most valuable asset. Time is the thing. You, they aren't making more of it. You can't get more of it. You don't even know how much you got. So. Thanks for spending it here on the Cowboy Perspective. Come back next time. We'll have another fun, interesting conversation with somebody who's just going to help us see the world from their perspective a little bit. And I I say there's some cowboy in there. (laughs) All right. Thanks, sir. Thank you.